All right, good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to the National Summer Learning Association webinar, Opportunities for Summer Learning in State Asset Plans. I'm Rachel Gwaltney, the Director of Policy and Partnerships at NSLA, and I'm so glad that you've joined us today because we do have a lot of great information to share. Um, today, we will discuss the Every Student Succeeds Act, or ESSA, or ESSA, and the many ways that states are including summer activities in their ESSA implementation plans. Um, please note a few logistics for today's webinar. The webinar is being recorded and will be posted on our website. We will email the PowerPoint slides to all participants after the webinar. The slides will include hyperlinks to some resources that I'm going to mention, and you can always get in touch with me after the webinar if you have follow-up questions or you need additional resources. Um, we're going to sort of stay at a little bit of a high level today and give some state examples. Um, if you're looking for information about your state's individual plan and the summer opportunities, just send me a note afterwards and I can share with you the information that we have on each state plan. Everyone's phone line should be muted for today's webinar. If you have any questions, please type them in the chat box at any time. We'll answer as many questions as we can as time allows. And we'll have a couple of points where we'll stop for questions and for you to share a little bit about what's happening in your program or in your community. For those of you who are new to the National Summer Learning Association community, this is a bit about who we are and what we do. NSLA is the only national nonprofit focused on closing the achievement gap by increasing summer learning opportunities for all youth. NSLA offers expertise and support for programs and communities and advocates for summer learning as a solution for equity and excellence in education. I wanna emphasize that many kinds of summer programs are in our community. These range from formal mandated programs um, that are summer school activities to drop in recreation programs and everything in between. So feel free to mention in the chat box what kind of programming um, you do back in your community. Our stakeholders include schools, summer and after school community based programs, libraries, parks and rec centers, public housing sites, sports camps, arts programs, and even families. Even though our name says learning, we mean that in a broad sense that includes both academic skill building, all kinds of enrichment content and activities, leadership development, summer jobs, summer nutrition, and much more. So everyone's welcome under the summer learning tent. So let's start by reminding ourselves a little bit about why summers are so important to student success. Summer learning loss, or the summer slide, has become a household term. In fact, over 100 years of research shows us that without access to meaningful learning experiences in the summer, kids lose ground on what they learned during the school year. Why does this happen? We sometimes refer to this as the faucet theory. During the school year, kids are connected to the resources they need because of equal access to public education. This can be meals, healthcare, after-school enrichment, tutoring, all kinds of services. In fact, we know that youth of all income levels and backgrounds progress at roughly the same rate during the school year. But during the summer, they're not in school. The faucet is turned off. Low-income and under-resourced students fall behind while their more resourced peers stay on track due to enriching summer learning experiences, whether these are formal or informal. And, you know, sometimes we have to contend with that idyllic view of summer, that unstructured time, playing outside, um, time with family, doing activities together, you know, making your own fun. But unfortunately, the reality for many low-income kids is that summer means a lack of access to basic needs, like meals, adult supervision, and meaningful guided activity. Parents consistently cite summer as the most challenging time for keeping kids safe and engaged in something meaningful. And this unstructured time doesn't enrich these kids, it goes to waste and sets them further behind their peers. In fact, we know a lot about the effect of summer learning loss, its disproportionate impact on kids living in poverty, and the impact on school year teaching and student success. The data points you see here and on the next two slides can be found on our Summer by the Numbers infographic, which is posted on our website, and I will also link to this in the resources for the presentation. We also know a lot about how to combat summer learning loss. So for example, recent research from the Ranch Corporation and the Wallace Foundation shows that students who participate regularly in voluntary summer programs make meaningful gains in reading and math. 
In terms of health and nutrition, the picture is similar to learning. We know that childhood hunger and food instability is especially prevalent during the summer. Um, youth who are eligible for free and reduced price meals at school are also eligible for the summer food service program, but for a variety of reasons, only one in seven children is able to access those summer meals. And minority children who lose access to regular healthy meals and physical education during the summer gain weight twice as fast as their more resourced peers. Research also shows that there's a gap between access and demand for programs. Um, nationally, about <clears throat> one third of families enroll their children in some kind of formal learning, summer learning program each year, while half would do so if a program were available. Um, cost is a major factor for families. Nationally, the average cost of a summer program is $288 per week per child. So if you think about a family with a couple of children looking for several weeks of programming, you see that this is not just a low income challenge. You know, many families face this cost challenge. And so when we think about federal, state, and local dollars that help keep these programs low cost or free to families, this data helps us understand why those efforts are so important. So this background brings us to the Every Student Succeeds Act, or ESSA, and how states and districts are able to use provisions in ESSA to support summer opportunities, which matter so much to childhood development and short-term and long-term academic success. You've probably been following the evolution of ESSA over the past two years, as we have. In 2015, Congress finally succeeded in passing the bipartisan reauthorization of the Elementary and Secondary Education Act. ESSA replaced No Child Left Behind, the previous version of EFEA, and President Obama signed ESSA into law on December 10, 2015. So a few activities are part of this transition that we're going through now into the ESSA era. The U.S. Department of Education issued guidance and regulations to clarify provisions of the new law and what they mean. State Departments of Education developed plans for their state ESSA implementation, which required them to collect input from many kinds of stakeholders. These state plans were submitted to the Department of Education for review in the fall, uh, spring or fall of 2017. All of the spring plans have been approved by the department and the fall plans are currently under review. And of course the change in administration, you know, caused some hiccups in the process, but things are basically on track for all plans to be finalized soon and districts are beginning their own local version of implementation planning. Um, the district planning process also includes the same kind of community input that was required for state plans. So I encourage you to reach out to your superintendent's office and learn what opportunities there are for you and your stakeholders to be part of this planning at the district level. And what happens after this? Um, technically, the law is due for reauthorization again after five years, but as we saw with NCLD, sometimes it takes much longer and the current provisions will stay in place until that happens. So, you know, we should be planning to work under ESSA for quite some time. You see here the current status of state plan approvals. The yellow states are those whose plans have been approved by the Department of Education, and the green states are those that are submitted and pending review as of last week. Um, you see the source link there on the side. Um, that, this map on their website is interactive and has links to each state plan and updates on news related to that plan. So if you're just starting to dig into your state's ESSA plan, this is a good place to start. Um, or you can always go to your state Department of Education website and find all the ESSA resources for your state there. So now we'll shift gears and dive into the provisions of ESSA that best support summer learning. We've been combing through these state plans, um, looking at references to summer learning, seeing how states are updating some of the programs that have historically supported summer opportunities, and how states are treating new programs under ESSA that offer opportunities to add new programming or to support what's already working in a school or district. So you see here an overview of the key areas of the law where summer opportunities appear in both the legislation itself and in state plans. And these are you know, what we'll dig into today. Um, I use these two images here to illustrate that even in a school-based setting, Summer learning led by schools is going to look like many different things, ranging from academic remediation or advancement to enrichment of all kinds of arts and sciences, to leadership programs, to career interests, and much more. Community partnerships are a major underlying theme of many of the ESSA provisions, 
um, especially those related to summer and wraparound types of services, and many schools engage such partners in their summer programming. So as we discuss these ESSA programs and examples from state plans, I hope you'll see many opportunities to support summer beyond just the standard academic remediation model. So 21st century community learning centers are, of course, a signature piece of federal funding for summer and after school programs. And a great deal of effort and advocacy went into preserving this program through the ESSA negotiations. So this was a big win for our field and we're grateful for everyone's participation in that effort. Um, not too much has changed in ESSA in regards to the requirements for 21st century. Um, while summer programs already cover many kinds of allowable uses for 21 CCLC dollars, the actual named list of those allowable activities is much more explicit. Um, it includes everything from youth development to service learning, arts and music, drug and violence prevention, um, nutrition and health education, physical fitness and wellness, STEM, financial literacy, just to name a few. The most significant change with 21st century is the explicit inclusion of expanded learning time or ELP programs, with the caveat that these must look and feel like out of school time programming. This is important because a major challenge with allowing schools to do ELP is that they simply create more schools. So, you know, 21st century is really intended for different kinds of learning and enrichment. So these guidelines are important and we see, we'll see that a few states' ESSA plans are explicit about how schools may use this option. Um, collaboration between schools and community partners continues to be a priority for this program. The new language states that external non-school partners should be those with a record of success in running or working with out-of-school time programs and activities. And programs are also expected to align more closely with state and local standards. So across the board, states are using ESSA as an opportunity to revise and update their 21 CCLC RFPs to better align with other statewide goals, to take advantage or better conform to the updated legislative language, and to infuse practices that we know are aligned with high quality. In some cases, we see focus on a theme, such as early learning, youth development, uh, STEM education, or focus on high needs schools. So Iowa will award competitive points to applications that serve priority schools rated as needing improvement on the state report cards. This approach aligns well with third grade literacy and other existing summer initiatives that are targeting students most in need of summer opportunities. North Dakota is calling out alignment between the 21 CCLC office and the Office of Early Learning to better coordinate services for young children using resources from the National Center for After School and Summer Enrichment, NCASE. And Maryland is targeting programs at specific grade levels to best support dropout prevention, including summer bridge programs into and out of middle, the middle grades. We also see states putting greater emphasis on indicators of quality. So DC and 12 states already require some minimum of summer programming for 21 CCLC applications. Um, a few others don't require summer, but do set a minimum amount of programming if summer is provided. And as we mentioned, many states are clarifying their requirements for um, extended learning time programs under 21 CCLC, offering this model as an option for proposals and spelling out requirements that programs be different from school day activities and require community partnerships. The Student Support and Academic Enrichment Grant is a new program that consolidates many small programs into one big block grant that states and districts will have a lot of flexibility over. There are three overarching categories of allowable activities, those that support student access to activities that contribute to a well-rounded education, um, those that support improving school climate for student learning, and those that support use of technology by schools. So certainly many of the activities named or intended by the well-rounded education component play into what schools may already be doing during the summer, um, with the law specifically naming student engagement and achievement in STEM, computer science, music, arts, foreign language, environmental education, um, and all kinds of other experiences. Um, we also see schools carrying some of the behavior management and anti-bullying sorts of efforts that feed school climate into the summer space as well. An important aspect of the legislative language for the SSAE program is the requirement of ongoing consultation with a wide variety of stakeholders. And this includes parents, teachers, principals, other school leaders, students, community-based organizations, local government representatives, 
and others with relevant and demonstrated expertise in programs and activities. So there are many ways for community partners to be engaged in this new grant program and these activities. Um, unfortunately, the low level of funding appropriated by Congress for this grant program has caused some disruption in implementation as Congress intended. So that's an issue that's at the top of our current federal policy priorities, and you'll be able to take action on this um, through our website. So how are states intending to use this program? The uncertainty around funding has caused, has caused some states to be cautious about making detailed plans, but we do have some ideas that we've seen. Um, many states, especially those with smaller uh, populations, will receive lower amounts of funding because this is sort of a by-student uh, funding approach. So they're combining this pot with some of the other small pots of funding into one larger consolidated application. Um, this approach is useful for schools and districts that already use other ESEA funds to support summer activities because it'll simply increase the overall amount of funding that's available. Some states are using this funding to bolster efforts already underway for a specific initiative that aligns with the program's priorities. Um, so DC mentions increased access to AP and IB classes. In Louisiana, the focus is reducing chronic absenteeism. In Montana, it's family engagement. And again, these funds offer you know, a new opportunity to expand services during the summer months um, in a way that specifically connects to school year achievement and overall student success. As was true with 21st century, some states are using the Title IV Part A grant to focus additional services on the schools and students most in need. So in the case of Nevada, the ESSA plan specifically mentions summer, summer academies as a strategy that will be supported. And in New York, these funds will support inclusion of community partners in comprehensive school needs assessment activities, including partners who provide summer programs. So again, with these funds, schools and districts will have a lot of flexibility, but perhaps not a lot of funding to start brand new initiatives. So we see most states planning to use these dollars to expand or deepen existing activities, with some are being explicitly named as an opportunity for expanded services in many states. So before we move on to some other programs, I want to take a quick pause. Um, if you have questions, please put them in the chat box. Um, or please add in the chat box, you know, how you currently use or are planning to use some of these Title IV funds um, for summer programming. We have not talked about community schools or promised neighborhoods in this webinar, but these are both areas where summer learning is an integrated strategy and ESSA does include funding for both programs also under Title IV. So please make a note in the chat box there if you've got any questions um, or any thoughts about how you've been using these funding streams or what your state, what you've been hearing about your state and, 24, and uh, the Title IV Part A grant, you know, feel free to chat away. Okay, so we'll move on um, and look at how ESSA explicitly calls out summer as an opportunity to support special populations and how states are taking up these opportunities. The Migrant Education Program has historically been used by many states for summer programming. Um, under ESSA, the program is maintained largely as is, and we see state plans getting more detailed on how to leverage these funds in a targeted way, with many choosing to focus on summer services. Um, of course, a major change to ESSA is the inclusion of accountability goals for English language learners. And so certainly there will be significant overlap in these populations. So it's important for states and districts to be thoughtful about combining funds across programs that support similar groups of students. Um, an example from past years is the use of migrant education summer funding to support transportation of migratory youth to summer literacy programs that are supported by Title I Part A. We see states addressing summer and migratory youth in some really creative ways. Um, and northern states in particular concentrate their migrant education programs during the summer months because that's when they have the highest number of migratory families in residence. So, you know, Colorado has a really interesting program described, described in their plan, um, the Summer Youth Leadership Academy, um, specifically for migratory youth. Um, some states like, like Massachusetts, Pennsylvania, and Tennessee have outlined in their state ESSA plans explicit data-driven summer learning goals for their migratory youth with pre- and post-assessment plans that'll connect their summer academic progress to their school year goals. 
One of the most innovative examples when it comes to interstate cooperation, Texas has worked with many of the several of the states to which Texas families migrate and concentrate during the summer to develop the Texas Migrant Interstate Program. And this cooperative includes data sharing arrangements and professional development for teachers to ensure that summer instruction for this youth, these youth is aligned with the school year academics that they'll be assessed on when they return to school in Texas. So we find this to be a really intriguing example of connecting summer learning to the school year, even who, for students who we might think of as highly transient and attend school in one state and summer learning in another state. Um, more broadly, some states are looking at integrated services for migratory families as opposed to specific youth-oriented goals. So Delaware is one that includes summertime family engagement activities that connect summer school to academics, family engagement, and other services that continue into the school year for migratory families. Two additional special populations that we want to discuss are youth who are experiencing homelessness and youth in the foster care system. ESSA explicitly mentions um, summer as an important time to connect with these youth under the provisions related to the McKinney-Vento Homeless Assistance Act and elsewhere in the law. And if you think back to the faucet theory that we discussed before, um, consider that homeless and foster youth are perhaps the most susceptible to the lack of services that are typically available during the school year. So in reference to summer, ESSA really focuses on access to programs by these youth and calls for intentional coordination of programming with other services like summer meals that these kids really need. And we see here some of the different ideas that states have called out in their plans. So these include ensuring access to the summer food service program, um, deliberately addressing barriers to access, such as by providing transportation, um, and working with school counselors to ensure that youth whose study is interrupted can recover lost credits through in-school or online programs during the summer. Um, New Jersey is a really interesting example. Their plan um, specifically calls out the issue of summer melt where low-income or first-generation college-bound youth fall through the enrollment and financial aid cracks over the summer and fail to matriculate even, if it, even after they have been accepted into college. Um, we have a research brief on summer melts on our website uh, that talks about this research, and New Jersey has named in their ESSA plan a specific strategy that was founded in this research of using text message technology to help students stay on top of deadlines. So this can be a really interesting model that other states may look at down the road. So let us know in the chat box um, how you have used school funding to support these special populations of youth in your programs, if that's, um, these are populations that you work with and that you've seen. Um, we'd be glad to hear how you use these types of funding in your own programs. So now we're going to look at a few specialized aspects of Title I, such as um, school transitions. The ESSA language calls for plans to include a description of how the state will work with LEAs to support academic success for elementary students with bridge programs, and also how LEAs will provide effective transitions of students to middle grades and high school to decrease the risk of students dropping out. So this is really under sort of dropout prevention. Um, how are states planning to use these bridge programs? States are targeting specific grade levels where students are most at risk of falling behind or getting off track. Maryland mentioned uh, academic support in particular at some key grades that are at, linked to dropout prevention. The Oregon plan encourages schools to especially look at the ninth grade year and how students are welcomed into high school and set up for success. New York and California focus on middle school and the many kinds of support that students need during these years to be successful. And Washington State, along with others, includes pre-K to K transition as an important strategy to get kids started on the right footing. In fact, many states have incorporated early learning and pre-K years throughout their ESSA plans, and this is really just one place where that happens. The ESSA language for targeted assistance schools um, includes the explicit provision that schools may use methods and instructional strategies, including expanded learning time, before and after school programs and summer programs and opportunities to strengthen academic programming. Direct student services is a small percent of discretionary Title I funding that states may set aside to work with districts on innovative approaches for student support. 
These funds must be targeted to districts with large numbers of schools identified for improvement, and services must be implemented through meaningful collaboration with diverse stakeholders. So these services can include a wide range of academic options, including many activities that typically happen during the summer months. Um, examples named in the law include advanced coursework or academic acceleration, career and technical education coursework, credit recovery, and components of a personalized learning approach, including high quality academic tutoring. So across the states, we see many ways in which summer is included as one strategy in the overall network of literacy-focused supports for low-income youth and underperforming schools, with just a few examples of the common approaches you see here. I especially want to point out here that the connection between literacy and other key priorities and teacher professional development. So Title II Part B is an ESSA program aimed primarily at developing teachers' skills as literacy instructors. This program also explicitly allows connecting out-of-school learning opportunities to in-school learning in order to improve children's literacy development and training families and caregivers to support the improvement of adolescent literacy. Um, Title II also allows community-based programs that help families support literacy instruction at home, which of course is critically important during the summer months when, schools, when students are not in school. And finally, ESSA plans, you know, touch on a variety of other activities that schools and community partners frequently provide during the summer. So these include things like family engagement activities, um, connections to career and technical education. They also call for greater coordination between state departments of education and other youth serving agencies like offices of child care and nutrition, which become critically important when schools are closed for the summer, but youth still need access to these services. And many state plans include summer teacher training on a variety of topics, including you know, early warning indicators, English language learners, career and technical education, STEM education, and literacy. So we see lots of different opportunities for parents, agencies, teachers to take advantage of summertime learning as well. Okay, are there any questions at this point? Please put them in the chat box. And again, I know we've just touched on, you know, some of the highlights of what you're seeing in states. You know, if you want to learn more and dig in with us more about what specific strategies, you know, your particular state is looking at, just send me a note after the webinar and we will, you know, provide you with the um, information about each, you know, your individual state plan. Any questions? So as we start to wrap up, um, I want to highlight a few opportunities to continue this conversation about summer learning at the federal, state, and local level. Um, district implementation planning is now underway, as we mentioned earlier, um, with the expectation that it will be completed by June. So now is the time to contact your district or superintendent's office for opportunities to provide input, whether as an educator or a member of the wider community. You can stay up to date with information from MSLA pertaining to summer learning and state and federal advocacy by joining our Summer Learning Advocates Common Ground group or by taking action through our online policy alerts and links to contact Congress on specific issues. So again, you'll see those links um, here. They're on our website. And when you receive the PowerPoint slides, you'll be able to click those links directly. We want you to mark your calendar for Summer Learning Day on July 12th and keep an eye on our website for Summer Learning Day resources to come uh, throughout the winter and spring. Um, we're also planning a Hill Day in Washington, D.C., um, which will likely be in April, so keep an eye out for that through our other communications. And don't forget that families are the most important local advocates for how schools and districts choose to spend money and what kinds of programming are offered. Um, from research, we know that parents consistently cite summer as the most difficult time for arranging stable childcare. They widely report supporting public funding for summer programming, and they agree that it's important for their children to have summer activities that help them maintain academic skills 
and learn new things. So it's essential that we continue to educate parents about summer learning loss, um, offer a range of low cost or free summer choices for youth, and engage families as vocal advocates for these programs. As we wrap up, I wanna point you to a couple of resources. Um, the Summer by the Numbers infographic has the data points that we discussed earlier. Um, our policy brief on the information that was shared in the webinar today is also available in our website, on our website in the Knowledge Center. We also have an article in use today that covers much of the similar information. Um, all of our resources are now in the NSLA Knowledge Center on our website, um, which is newly redesigned, you may notice. Um, so you can browse through the Knowledge Center. You can look at resources on many different topics. Um, we also have a connection to the Wallace Foundation's Knowledge Center on Summer Learning, and a lot of the great research on best practices for summer programs lives there. So you can find all of this on our website, um, summerlearning.org, and the Knowledge Center is under resources. Okay, so thank you for joining us for today's webinar. Um, my contact information is here if you want to follow up with me about any questions or resources that you're looking for. Um, please stay in touch with us and let us know what's happening in your state or community and how NSLA can help you. So thanks for joining us today.